very much. Thank you. It's lovely to be here. I'd, I've heard of Barry over my academic life, but I'd never experienced it. And I must say, it's really something to experience. Uh, what a lovely campus and uh, what wonderful people. So it's been a delight to be here. I began with uh, an epigraph. Analyzing humor is like dissecting a frog. Few people are interested and the frog dies of it. <laughs> E.B. White. Every seminary uh, class has a joke and I began with the one that my seminary class specialized in. It seems that John the 23rd had an archaeological expedition in the Holy Land. They made a great discovery that the head of the expedition thought presented certain theological problems. He called John the 23rd announcing he had some good news and some bad news. The good news was that they had discovered the tomb in which Jesus was laid after the crucifixion. The bad news, he said to John, is the bodies in it. <laughs> the head of the expedition thought he ought to alert John the 23rd to the findings before they were generally known because it might entail some theological rethinking. John thanked the head of the expedition for letting him know because he needed to pray and think about the news. He prayed and thought, but was unsure what to say. Finally, he said to himself, My old friend Rudy Bultmann, the German New Testament scholar, has thought long and hard about these matters. I will call him to see what he thinks. After all, whoever wrote the New Testament mythology must have something to say. He called Bultman explaining he had some quite momentous news that he feared might upset Bultman, but he needed Bultman's help. John the 23rd explained about the archaeological expedition and the finding of the tomb. Then again he warned Bultman what he had to say might make him deeply upset, but he had to tell him the truth if he was to get his help. So he said, the bodies in the tomb. There was a long silence on Boltman's end. John the 23rd waited, waited, and waited, fearing that Boltman's faith had been shattered. Finally, Boltman responded, so he really existed. <laughs> The, um, I understand that some of you that don't know Rudolf Bultmann won't find that as funny as, um, <laughs> which is part of the uh, uh, joke. This was the joke we told to seminarians at Yale Divinity School in 1965. At the time, the joke certainly needed no explaining. Bultmann was the New Testament historian theologian we read. His presumption that we had little evidence to secure knowledge of the historical Jesus dominated discussions of New Testament scholarship. That Bultmann might be upset or at least had to respond, um, had to reconsider his views if the body was found, we thought to be quite funny. I confess I still find the joke not only funny, but a nice commentary on the scholarship surrounding New Testament when I was in seminary. I suspect the story is not nearly so funny for current uh, uh, generations of seminarians as well as undergraduates. Bultmann simply does not dominate New Testament scholarship the way he did when I was a student. Indeed, he can be read as a deeply conservative thinker about questions surrounding Jesus given developments in New Testament scholarship since he wrote. Better put, theologically, Bultmann never doubted that Jesus matters. But I suspect that, that for the joke to work, the current students that, uh, for current students, they will need some explanations that inform them about what Bultmann was about as well as his scholarship. A familiar but often forgotten point about attempts to be funny, that is, humor is profoundly contextually dependent as it, as, as it uh, depends on common presumptions and habits. 
I began with an example of a joke, but I take as my task in this paper to explore a more general question than the joke may suggest. I want to try to understand the role of humor in theology. Most of those who practice Christian theology think that they are engaged in a serious science. That it is so should not be surprising given the reality that at the center of Christian theology is a crucified Savior. Moreover, any theology that is doing the work of theology well must deal with the fundamentals of, his, of life, that is, birth and death and all the stuff in between. Stuff like love and the betrayal of love. Those subjects not only are serious, but if truthful, truthfully addressed, sentimentality and superficial nostrums must be avoided. Humor can be one of the ways that sentimentality and superficiality can be defied. M. A. Screech observes in his erudite and wise book, Laughter at the Foot of the Cross, that man is a laughing animal. He traces that claim to Aristotle and Aquinas, a claim I might add, I think, to be more basic than the general characterization that the distinguishing character of being human is our rationality. I call attention to Screech's observation, an observation he develops uh, by close attention to the work of, uh, of Erasmus and Rabelais in order to distinguish the questions of whether and how theology can and should be funny from the questions of the task of theology to provide an account of how our humanity entails our being funny. These questions are obviously interrelated, but they are not the same question. In this lecture, I am primarily concerned with the former. By beginning with a joke, as well as using the description funny, I mean to distinguish what I'm about from attempts to characterize Christian theology in general by using genre categories such as tragedy or comedy. I have no reason to deny the general characterization of Christianity as comedic can be quite informative. For example, in the comedy of redemption, Ralph Wood argues quite persuasively that Christian vision of the world is fundamentally comedic. Drawing on the, on the insights of Carl Loeth, Wood observes that because Christians do not, as the ancients did, regard, regard the universe as eternal or divine, but as created, comedy is made possible by the acknowledgement of the sheer contingency of all that is. According to Wood, what the Christian faith confesses is that God in the Jews and Jesus has perpetrated the most outrageous of tricks, a joke to end all jokes, a surprise beyond all surprises. God has upset our tragic comedy equilibrium. In Israel and Christ, God acts unilaterally to deliver the human race from its diabolic enslavement. I find Wood's account of the comic character of the Christian narrative to be insightful. I worry, however, that the use of tragedy and comedy to characterize the Christian worldview runs the problem of diverse understandings of tragedy and comedy. The concept of tragedy and comedy depends so heavily on the literature that they are meant to characterize, it is unclear how helpful those descriptions are when turned into general designations. Greek tragedy may have some resemblance to the tragedies of Shakespeare, but the difference Christianity made for Shakespeare's tragedy means to characterize the plays of the Greeks and Shakespeare as tragic may not be instructive and possibly deeply misleading. I say this as someone who once entitled a book, Truthfulness and Tragedy, in my defense, I was using tragedy to avoid a lesser of two evil argument. I still think there may be something to that, but, there's, but that's a subject for another day. Yet I do think, in spite of the considerable evidence to the contrary, that theology can and should be, in some sense, in, uh, in some sense funny. Theology done right should make you laugh. 
Chris Hubner, a Canadian Mennonite, which is a laugh in itself. Chris Hubner, in a recent article on my work entitled Make Us Your Laughter, Stanley Hauerwas's Joke on the Mennonites, makes some insightful comments about my use of laughter that I find extremely informative. Hubner, for example, calls attention to my joking fun, poking fun at the Mennonites in a sermon such, on, uh, such as entitled On Milk and Jesus as my way to help Mennonites recognize what a funny people they are. Hubner observes my use of laughter is my attempt to practice theology in a manner that refuses the attempt to manage the world. In short, my use of laughter is an appropriate theological antidote to the Constantinian desire for control. Hubner argues it's important to note that my use of laughter does not mean I lack an appropriate seriousness. He suggests, I think rightly, that there is no contradiction between something at once being serious and it being funny. I do, however, have a deep distaste for the clawing seriousness associated with some forms of pietism. But my use of laughter to counter what I regard as feigned profundity is my attempt, as Hubner puts it, to offer a response to the idolatrous temptation to take ourselves more seriously than God. Humor, Hubner calls attention to my self-designation as a high church Mennonite to illustrate how I use humor to make a serious theological point. He rightly suggests that I use the description as a joke. He doubts it's all that funny, but credits my use of the description as a way to raise theological questions about how we define our identity. Hubner argues I'm trying, probably not very successfully, to call into question our preoccupations with identity. My use of the description High Church Mennonite is but one expression of my general concern that preoccupation with neatness tends to generate models of theological discourse that are met methodologically egoistic. Without laughter, our speech about the strange and surprising funny God we worship threatens to become speech about ourselves. By calling attention to the importance of humor and laughter in theology, I'm trying to suggest that theology should be done in an entertaining manner. Humor is not only a mode of entertainment the discourse of theology can take, but it surely is the case that we, and the we means most people, are often attracted to speech and writing that is funny. An observation that calls into question the presumption by some that if you want that if you want what you have to say to be entertaining, then you have to be, then you cannot be serious. I've tried to defy the presumption by attempting to do theology in a manner that tickles the imagination. For example, some years ago, I wrote an essay entitled A Tale of Two Stories on Being a Christian and a Texan. The essay began by acknowledging I want to entertain my reader while doing what I take to be a serious intellectual job. I wrote the essay first and foremost to honor my parents in the hope that if they read the essay, they would recognize how deeply I valued the way they had formed me to be a Texan without regret. I assumed such training was necessary condition to be a human being. I always, I lo Baylor University has on its shield um, in Latin, pro ecclesia pro texana, the only ontological realities that matter. <laughs> I also wrote the essay for my own amusement because in it I was able to use William Humphrey's great novel, The Ordways, to elicit what it means to be a Texan. That novel, moreover, is filled with stories of Texans trying to make it in a hard land that is at once humorous and sad. The serious intellectual work the essay was meant to do was to respond to the criticism that a focus on narrative as a basic grammar of Christian speech fails to appropriately acknowledge that no one narrative can or should constitute our lives. On being a Christian and a Texan was my way to show how different stories work to shape our lives. I also wanted to show how the different stories that possess us can be judged more or less truthful by suggesting how the narratives generally recognized as Christian makes how the story of Texas must be told as well as lived.
The great trick is how the injustice that is inherent in the stories that are Texas can be remembered without their being justified. I should like to think A Tale of Two Stories is not only entertaining, but is exact, but it is so exactly because it was serious theology. Then, of course, there is my semi-famous essay, My Gays as a Group are Morally Superior to Christians as a Group. That short essay was meant to be funny by reframing the question of gay relationships in terms of there at the time, doubtful status in the military. I ask, how did gays do something so morally creative as get themselves banned from the military as a group? <laughs> Why couldn't this happen to Christians? I mean, allegedly, you know, we're just war people. Um, um, uh, we have to worry about, we can't bomb there. We think we ought to tell the enemy the truth. Uh, would you want to shower with them? You never know when they want to lay baptism on you. I mean, you know, I mean, why, why can't Christians get themselves banned from the military as a group? That was my uh, uh, question. Um, um, if Christians as followers of Christ found themselves banned from the military as a group, I thought, then arguments about gay participation in the church could be quite different. But enough about me. There is much more to be said about why theology needs to be funny. In particular, I want to call attention to the theologians I think may be the funniest in the Christian tradition, that is, Karl Barth. Before doing so, however, I need to prepare the ground for Barth's humor by calling attention to a philosophical analysis of jokes. For it is by Paying close attention to jokes, we will better be able to understand that jokes are no joking matter. I had once thought to entitle this paper, How to Tell a Theological Joke, but jokes are a more specific category than, than a story that is funny. Jokes are funny, but not everything that is funny is a joke. However, by attending to an analysis of jokes, I hope to throw more light on what it means for theology to be funny. There is also the question of the relation between jokes that, uh, uh, jokes that is what is funny and irony. It is probably the case that irony is a more inclusive category than either jokes or what is funny. Jokes often employ irony, but irony is not always in the form of a joke, nor is it necessarily funny. There is no reason to assume, nor is it crucial for the case I want to make, that these conceptual questions must be settled. I'm content if the analysis of jokes I now will provide will help illumine what it means for theology to be funny. The question of the relation of the theologian to theology needs to be addressed. It is one thing to suggest that a theologian needs a sense of humor. It's quite something else to argue that their theology must be funny. I acknowledge the distinction, but I will maintain that not only one should not only should theologians know how to laugh at themselves, but also their theology should also manifest the joy that reflects the glory of God. Of course, it is not the same as what makes something funny, but what is funny depends first and foremost on a joyful recognition that God is God and we are not. The joke is on us. Ted Cohen has written a very insightful and funny book on jokes. He entitled the book, Jokes, Philosophical Thoughts on Joking Matters. Philosophical thoughts should not scare off any potential reader because the kind of philosophy Cohen represents does not need to call attention to itself. For example, he confesses when he first began to write about jokes, he thought they could be divided into pure and conditional jokes. A conditional joke would be those that only work with specific audiences. Cohen's explora exploration of jokes, however, has convinced him that there is no such thing as a pure joke, that is, a joke that would work no matter who it was told to and by, but for what purposes. That is a philosophical point. But Cohen does not reference or elaborate the philosophical sources that clearly inform his judgments that there are no pure jokes. 
For example, he tells a joke about the president of a small college who wants to improve the school's academic reputation. The president is told the best way to do that is to create a few first-rank departments. He first focuses on the mathematics department because he's told to increase their quality would, be, would not be very expensive. After all, the only thing mathematicians need, he is told, it, to do their work are pencils, papers, and wastebaskets. However, the ambitious president then judges it might be even less expensive to make the philosophy department rather than mathematics department that much better because philosophers do not need wastebaskets. <laughs> You do not need to be a mathematician or a philosopher or even an academic to enjoy the joke, but you do need some understanding of, math of the mathematicians' demand for elegance, as well as philosophers' presumed professional license to say what they, what they please because there is no way to prove them right or wrong. <laughs> Cohen notes that not all jokes require specialized information or professional jargon, but they may require a little knowledge about a specific subject. He provides as an example a response of a man when asked by a panhandler outside a theater for a handout. The man declined the hand, to give the handout saying, neither a borrower or a lender be William Shakespeare. The panhandler replied, Blank you, David Manette. I, uh, there's a word there I couldn't use. On, uh. <laughs> as I noted, Cohen, Cohen does not, as he might have done, call attention to philosophical accounts of rationality that would support his argument that there is no such thing as a pure joke. But he does rightly argue that every attempt to provide a general theory of jokes turns out to be wrong. Of course, some jokes draw on what we assume is general knowledge of the human condition, such as jokes about death and illness. That some jokes just seem to work on the basis of such knowledge, Cohen argues, is not sufficient to ground a general theory of jokes, however. Thus, the method is of his analysis of jokes depends always on exemplification. For example, the joke, one good thing about Alzheimer's disease that if you get it, you can hide your own Easter eggs. <laughs> Might be one that anyone could get. <laughs> but Cohen notes that some find such a joke disagreeable, indicates how illness is experienced makes all the difference for how such a joke is meant to work. The fact that those with the disease as well as those that care for them are more likely to find the joke funny is but a further indication that we do not need a general theory about jokes. Rather, what we need is insight. Thus, the observation that those that find the joke funny do so because the joke helps defeat the loneliness associated with the disease. Cohen observes that he thinks that what makes a successful joke successful is the sense held mutually by teller and hearer that they're joined in feeling. That a good jokes are concise is due to the fact that so much can go unsaid because of what the teller and the hearer share in common. Cohen even uses the language of intimacy to describe what he takes to be the effect of a good joke. By intimacy, he means a shared sense of community a joke at once reflects and creates. Members know they are in such communities, according to Cohen, to the extent that they can identify a shared set of beliefs, dispositions, prejudices, preferences, in short, a common outlook on the world, and shared feelings created by the joke itself. According to Cohen, these two conditions of community that make a joke possible can be cultivated and realized without jokes. But with jokes, our shared feelings are enhanced by our common outlook about the way things are. When we laugh at the same thing, something important is happening. That we laugh at all, he suggests, is noteworthy. This is true even when we laugh alone, but when we laugh together, we experience the satisfaction of a deep human longing, the realization of a desperate hope. 
It is the hope that we are enough like one another to, sen to sense one another, to be able to live together. Cohen argues, therefore, that when a joke is successful, there is nothing to point to but the joke itself. That is why you know if you have to explain a joke, you have an indication that something has gone wrong that cannot be fixed by explanation. <laughs> when a joke is unsuccessful, you cannot show that the joke is really an example of some other case that should be acknowledged as funny. The joke either works or it does not, just as a practical reason works or it does not. Cohen does not explicitly call attention to jokes as exemplification of practical reason, but his account of how jokes work I take to be a compelling exemplification of how practical reason, at least the practical reason is understood by Eugene Garver and Aristotle, works. Jokes can be understood rhetorically as one of the means we have to make common knowledge common. Just as practical reason extends its range by engaging problems that would not exist without our being the kind of people we are, so jokes can be created by imagining a problem for oneself. Any subject will do. Cohen, for example, asks, what is a sacramento? It is the stuffing in a Catholic olive. <laughs> He acknowledges this is not a great joke, <laughs> but one he and Richard Bernstein, another philosopher, made up after having given themselves the challenge of making up a joke about pimentos. Perhaps a better example is that created by playing on certain words. Thus, the 85-year-old man's response to doubt about his claim to have sex almost every night. For instance, he says, this week I almost had it on Monday, almost on Tuesday, almost on Wednesday. <laughs> Cohen observes that though it is stimulating to explore new topos to joke about, it is even more stimulating when the topic is extremely specific. He uses, for example, a snail jokes. What does a snail say when riding on the back of a turtle? Whee! <laughs> our turtle was mugged and our, our turtle was mugged and robbed by a gang of snails. When asked for a description of the robbers, the turtle replied, I'm sorry, I just don't know, it all happened so fast. <laughs> Cohen suggests such jokes limits are comparable to Stravinsky's remark that the most strict and rigid musical forms, forms like the fugue, are the most liberating for the composer because they free one from the need to worry about too many possibilities and leave the composer to exploit his talent by being inventive within the confines of the form. What a wonderful, <coughs> wonderful quote. Perhaps the most fundamental role of jokes, however, is their use to comprehend the unexpected and absurd aspects of life. We laugh at that which defies, defies our ability to make sense of events in our lives. According to Cohen, such laughter is an expression of our humanity, our finite capacity, our ability to live with what we cannot understand or subdue. We can dwell with the incomprehensible without dying from fear or going mad. This role of jokes is particularly important for those who are under the control of others, just to the extent jokes help those in such a situation to laugh at their oppressor, and if they are lucky, the joke is, and if the joke is very good, makes the oppressor laugh at themselves. Jokes often have a subversive character that cannot be acknowledged exactly because subversion is portrayed by being acknowledged. Yet there is no escaping how jokes must deal with death. Death, moreover, is the subject Cohen suggests is the gateway for appreciating that particular tradition of jokes associated with Judaism. Cohen, Cohen's Jewish jokes t reflect the Jewish acknowledgments of life's incomprehensibility. Jewish jokes also manifest the, the sanctions internal to Judaism that are meant to uh, respond to the incomprehensibilities of life. 
Cohen provides a number of long Jewish jokes that underwrite the Jewish stereotypes of themselves. For example, there was an elderly rabbi in Brooklyn whose piety was renowned but whose faith had begun to waver. Pondering his growing spiritual crisis, he reasoned as well as prayed that if the Holy One of Israel would strengthen the rabbi's faith, he would ensure that the rabbi would win the New York State Lottery. The rabbi waits for weeks and months, continuing to pray that he will win the lottery and his faith will be renewed. Finally, standing alone in the synagogue, he hears a rumbling and observes a brilliant light from which a beautiful, melodious voice that seems to come from nowhere saying, so new, buy a ticket. <laughs> Cohen thinks this kind of, Je of Jewish joke reflects the Jewish ability to laugh at absurdity as a way to negotiate the imponderables of life. <laughs> Jewish humor reflects the conception of human decency found in the Hebrew Bible in which the mystification of the world is a laughing acceptance of a kind of spiritual embrace. Moses is the great exemplification of this response to the world as before the burning bush he, he answered, Here I am. That response is not funny, but Cohen suggests that Moses' response has a quality that pleased God. It pleased God because Moses turns aside to look at what he cannot comprehend. Cohen, in like manner, argues that Abraham and Sarah's response to the announcement that they would have a child late in life is paradigmatic of the development of Jewish humor. Such laughter, laughter that is a response to the incomprehensibility of the world, is nonetheless an acceptance of that same world. The world and its inhabitants are forever doing the damnedest things. It is one, uh, it is it is one Jewish mode of acceptance and appreciation to receive in their, in their wonder that life. Then, then this laughter may be heard as the echo of faith. This does not mean that Jews have a monopoly on jokes. Yet there is a characteristic association of Jews with a joking spirit that Cohen argues is not accidental. It is the jokes of outsiders that exploit a deep and lasting concern and fascination with the logic of language associated with Judaism. The observation with language and its logic characteristic of Jewish humor, Cohen suggests, comes from the bilingual character of Jewish existence, particularly in America. Yet he argues that bilingualism is not sufficient to explain the Jewish fascination with language. The Jewish tradition of reasoning and argument developed in the study of Jewish texts, Cohen thinks, is crucial for understanding Jewish humor. For it is the character of Jewish tradition that debate is not only necessary for an, but unending. For example, Cohen tells the story from the Talmud of the debate between the scholars about whether a cooking oven or a particular kind uh, of a particular kind is ritually clean. The debaters are in a room and Rabbi Ben Abraham says, if my views are correct, may the walls of this room fall down. The walls not wanting to, sell, uh, to uh, settle a dispute between rabbis only go halfway down. Rabbi Ben Joshua says, if my views are correct, may the tree outside this window fall down. The tree not wanting to settle a dispute between rabbis only goes halfway down. Rabbi Ben Yokai says, if my views are correct, may Yahweh himself speak from heaven and say, my views are correct. And a voice came from heaven. Rabbi Ben Yokai's views are the correct ones. Rabbi Ben Abraham and Rabbi Ben Joshua said, where is it written in Torah that Yahweh can settle a dispute between rabbis? <laughs> and Yahweh went away shaking his head saying, my people have defeated me. 
that much of Jewish humor is directed at themselves is an indication of the Jewish confidence in who they are. Yet Cohen raises the question of how far one can go in using humor to subvert oneself and still be oneself. Cohen thinks the Marx Brothers managed to at once be Jewish but American by making American humor Jewish. Of course, it is true that nothing could be more Jewish than the entertaining judgments against the Jews. But Cohen worries that the negative judgments about Jews by people like Freud, Marx, and Wittgenstein may suggest a self-hate that is anything but healthy. Cohen therefore concludes his wonderful book by raising the question of when, if at all, a joke is appropriate. He observes that the widespread conviction exists that some jokes on some occasions are morally objectionable. But it's not at all clear what makes a joke have this moral defect. He thinks it unlikely to be able to answer what makes a joke immoral by appealing to some moral theory. Given the method of his book, a method that clearly shows the influence of Stanley Cavell, whom he claims to be a friend, to appeal to uh, a moral theory would betray the book's very argument. But just as important, Cohen does not think any theory could provide what is needed because theories cannot help but oversimplify the diverse character of the comedic. Most moral theories would try to show that an immoral joke harms someone or reveals or reduces the moral character of the one who tells the joke. Cohen doubts that anyone can show these results obtain. Instead, Cohen gives some friendly advice. If you feel a joke is no damn good, express your feeling of moral disapproval. If you're asked to defend your judgment by giving moral theo theoretical reasons for your negative judgment, ask your interlocutor why you need to ground your judgment in a theory. Rather, what you must do is clarify matters for yourself and choose your words carefully, making sure that the words are really your words. We rightly feel disgust when, expected, when exposed to jokes that are clearly racist, but crucial for the expression of that disgust is the available of moral vocabulary to do work that needs to be done. That is why Cohen's account of jokes seems to me so compelling. I've given an extensive account of Cohen on jokes because I find his analysis of jokes illuminating for thinking about how Christians' theology should be funny. In particular, I will try to make a case for how theology can and should be funny by calling attention to exemplifications of humor in the work of Karl Barth. I will end with a final brief look at some of my own suggestions. Before engaging Barth, or me, however, I want to explore questions Cohen's analysis of Jew Jewish humor has raised for me. Why is there nothing in Christianity equivalent to the Jewish humor? As far as I know, there is, no there is no recognizable tradition of Christian humor comparable with Cohen's account of Jewish humor. Of course, Christians can be quite funny, but they are seldom funny as Christians. Is there something about the very content of Christian faith that discourages Christians from having fun with our most fundamental convictions? For example, consider the following. Jesus was walking down a dusty road when a woman ran toward him because she was being pursued by a mob of men calling her by slanderous names and bent on killing her by stoning her. As the woman approached Jesus, he raised his arms, stopped the approaching men, and with eye blazing stared at the woman's pursuers and then said, Let him who is without sin cast the first stone. Soon one man and then another man dropped their stones and began to retrace their steps. It seemed clear that the men would disperse, but suddenly a rock from the back of the group of men came flying out, striking the woman on the forehead so that she fell to the ground. Jesus said, Mother, sometimes you really piss me off. <laughs> Now that is clearly not a very funny joke. 
I suspect many Christians would find it distinctively offensive. You just do not make fun of the mother of Jesus. Jesus may have told his parents he must be about his father's business, but Jesus is Jesus and we are not. What, it is, what is it about the, about the gospel narratives and the letters of Paul that seem to inhibit the Christian sense of humor? Does the dramatic character of the struggle against the powers of destruction at the heart of the gospel mean that Christians simply have no place for making fun of themselves and the world? As I suggested above, a story that has at its center a crucified Savior just does not invite funny commentary. But there is the resurrection. I've always thought Thomas's recognition of Jesus profoundly comedic. Jesus returns and offers his wounds to Thomas to touch. So Thomas' demands for confirmation might be met. Thomas, and the text does not say he actually touched Jesus, says, My Lord and my God. What an extraordinary response. You would have thought, given his worries about Jesus' actual return, he would have said something like, Oh, you're back. Tell me about it. But instead, he confesses, Jesus is Lord. That confession surely has the ring of joy, if not laughter. The world will never be the same. In an extraordinary Easter sermon entitled, One Day You Will Laugh, Sam Wells observes that laughter is often used in a defensive manner to help us deal with unpleasant realities which often turn out to be other people. But laughter can also be used as an attack mode to belittle. Thus jokes used, uh, thus jokes used to make us laugh at rather than with other people. In contrast, Wells suggests that the laughter that is the resurrection is an infection and irresistible laughter that can overwhelm all who it in encounters with joy. If Wells is right about this, and I certainly think or at least hope he is, the question remains why Christians have failed to see the humor that pervades our scriptures and the lives of those who have preceded, uh, who, uh, have, um, preceded us. It is not my intention to worry over this question about how the gospel narratives may or may not be, uh, may not inhabit or encourage what may be thought of as jokes, or at least funny uh, stories. I certainly think Cohen is on to something by suggesting that the very character of Jewish debate about the law invited an imagination open to what might be called the grammar of the comedic. Could it be that the very character of Christianity as a faith, that one joins only by deep conviction, inhabits a sense of, of humor about being Christian? Jews do not get to choose to be Jews. To be a Jew simply comes with the territory known as the body. Such a stance invites a com confidence that one has nothing to lose to the lose so that one can even complain that given the trials Jews have gone through uh, over the centuries, they can rightly wonder, is this any way to be chosen? But we know you exist. I suspect, however, far more significant for understanding the difference between Judaism and Christianity on the matters committed is Cohen's suggestion that the long history of Jews being outsiders has implanted in Judaism a distinct tradition of humor. Christians have sought to be in control of the worlds in which we found ourselves. If you desire to rule the world, the incomprehensibility of the world, Cohen suggests, is that the heart of Judaism must be denied or tamed. Constantinianism is but the name for the Christian attempt to make the world intelligible for Christians and non-Christians alike. What cannot be tolerated are forms of humor that might make the attempt to control a dangerous world absurd. The subversive character of humor often expressed in jokes is an undeniable reality. <laughs> Those who use humor to, be, to subvert the pretensions of the powerful often have little to use. One might think that the eschatological character of the Christian faith would make Christians a people who have learned to live loose. 
To be able to live, so to be able to so live is made possible by the recognition that the use of humor in a defensive or attack mode is an indication of a people enslaved by their fears. Christians can risk being subversive because they believe they, they, there is a deeper reality than the world determined by fear. There is, I believe, a close relationship between Christian justifications of the use of violence to bring order in a disordered world and the absence of humor among Christians. Christian nonviolence is surely an absurd position requiring that you learn to live by your wits, which often takes the form of your ability to talk your way out of tough situations. The great surprise that Christians are called to witness, the, supreme, the surprise that God became subject to our violence so that we might live nonviolently, is surely the basis for the Christian identification with the Jews. If I suspect we're coming to the end of Christendom, we may, as Christians, discover we actually have a sense of humor. I give as evidence of the possibility of that development the work of Karl Barth. Karl Barth, of course, was the great enemy of cultural Christianity. I suspect he was naturally funny, but his humor was also a reflection of the character of his theology. Only a person with a profound sense of humor would write 14 volumes called The Church Dogmatics. Bart was asked as he began volume four of The Church Dogmatics uh, what it was like, and he said, well, I had a dream last night, and I dreamed I came to the pearly gates, and I knocked, and Peter came, and I said, I'm here, and Peter said, who? Carl Bart, I'm here. And I turned around and I had all 14 volumes of my church dogmatics in a little red wagon. And Peter said, oh yes, won't you come in? And Bart said, and I pulled my red wagon down the golden street with lined with angels on each side and all the angels laughed. And with the grain of the universe, the church, witness, and natural theology, I have a footnote in which I discuss Bart's report of an exchange between Harnack and Pedersen, in which Harnack challenged Pedersen to name which dogmas and which centuries and for which church should have authority. Pedersen had argued that the church had authority over against scripture. Deeply sympathetic with Pedersen, Bart maintained that theology requires the theologian identify with this or that confession of faith in this or that branch of the church, together with this or that presupposed affirmation of the ancient church on which the confession rests. Yet Bart acknowledged that in the present day, theology has no church behind her, which has the courage to say unambiguously, this is the highest concreteness. As a result, Bart observes, theologians are in a position dictated by King De Nebuchadnezzar, who demanded that his wise men tell him not only what his dreams meant, but what they dreamed. I observed that Pedersen became a Roman Catholic. Bart wrote the dogmatics. That he did so is surely a testimony to his profound sense of humor, lacking no answer to Harnack's question. Jessica Deku helpfully locates Bart's most extended discussion of humor in his Ethics, which was originally published in 1928. Bart did not publish the Ethics during his lifetime, one suspects, because in this book he was testing how to think about ethics, the result which would, re would receive mature expression in the church dogmatics. But I think Deco is right to suggest that Bart's fundamental attitude about the significance of humor in theology he developed in this book never changed. It did not change because in the ethics, Bart grounded humor in the eschatological character of the Christian faith, which means it is incumbent on Christians to refuse to take the present with ultimate seriousness. Such a perspective elicits a, a liberated laughter that derives from the knowledge of our final position, in spite of appearances to the contrary with present reality. Bart observes that humor is fluid and flexible because it reflects what is done in time but from the standpoint of eternity. He says humor 
arises when the contrast between our eon is perceived and vitally sensed in what we do. Humor concerns the present as such with a strange connection within and with our involvements. We cannot change the future into the present and the present into the future. We must persevere as best we can. We have humor when we do this. Accordingly, we must first laugh at ourselves, though that we can laugh at others making possible the final, la final test of being laughed at by them. Bart concludes his account of humor by observing a, an observation clearly meant to be funny, that a serious problem with Calvin is that he seemed to have lacked a sense of humor. Bart does not deny that we must also live with an appropriate seriousness about the present but we cannot take the present with ultimate seriousness. Humor that is, genu that is genuine, however, is that which is appropriately serious. Thus Bart's remark, of humor too, one may say that it is genuine when it is the child of suffering. From Bart's perspective, that a great, the great trick is to learn to live as a human being with the possibilities and limits that constitute our being human. Humor is liberation because it expresses an acceptance of our limitations in the light of our eschatological future. Decau observes that Bart's complaint about humorlessness reflects his impatience with boredom. For example, Bart Bart's objections to natural theology are well known, but it's quite interesting that one of his most profound concerns about natural theology is too often work done in that name is, he says, profoundly tedious and so unmusical. In a similar fashion, Bart found theological work done in the liberal tradition failed to take seriously when it, what it means to be a human being exactly because of the absence of laughter in liberal theology. To describe faith as ultimate or unconditional concern is to take a far too serious view about what it means to be a human being. For Bart, we are fundamentally animals who laugh. Humor pervades the dogmatics, but Bart explicitly discusses the significance of humor in his account of honor in Church Dogmatics 3-4. Humor is a necessary attitude for any account of honor because a person can only be honorable as an expression of pure thankfulness that the honor that is due comes from God. Accordingly, the person honored by God finds himself oddly the object of such esteem. Thus Sarah laughed on being told of the birth of Isaac. Bart asked, is not the contrast between man himself and the honor done him by God really too great for man to take himself ceremoniously and not to laugh at himself in his quality as his bearer and possessor? In the context of his discussion of honor, Bart discusses his character with his characteristic humor by recounting the story of a person who is reported to have died because of a negative review of one of his books. Bart clearly with tongue in cheek declares, but he had no business to do this. I do not know if Bart meant that his judgment uh, that the man had no business to do it to be funny, but it's hard to believe Bart did not recognize at once how silly as well as how funny it is for him to make such a judgment. Some years later, in a preface to, in, to Church Dogmatics 4.2, Bart returns to his conflict with the neo-Calvinist in the Netherlands. He begins by saying he needs to make some necessary amends. He observes that the wrath of a man whom uh, who does what is right is in the sight of he observes the wrath of a man seldom does what is right in the sight of God. Responding to the publication of Buckhauer's book on Bart's theology, a book that treats Bart uh, so fairly, Bart says he must withdraw his ill-founded words he unleashed against the neo-Calvinist. So he, he, they will have nothing in the future to fear from Bart, he says, as long as, as long as they do not say any more unseemly things about Mozart. 
Some may find Bart's love of Mozart odd given Bart's attack on all forms of cultural Christianity. But as Ralph Wood has argued, exactly because Bart's theology was so sure of the victory of Christ, he was free to enjoy the world. Bart, according to Wood, understood that the Bible contains the one ultimate cause for laughter and rejoicing. Its joy is not cheap and easy, but sometimes deep-seated and lasting. Indeed, it often comes reluctantly. We may as well admit it, Bart says of the, of the believer, he has something to laugh at, and he just cannot keep help laughing, even though he does not feel like it. From Bart's perspective, Mozart, as many who are not necessarily Christian have done, heard the harmonies of creation to which the shadows also belong. Bart was so energetic and spirited human being, even if he had not become a theologian, he would have been the kind of person you cannot help but find attractive. At least one of the reasons for such attraction would have been that he, he was genuinely funny. Stories abound about his humor, and some of them may be true. For example, I know the story is true. For example, and I know this story is true. John Howard Yoder had written a very critical paper on Bart's view of war entitled Karl Bart and the Problem of War. Yoder being Yoder gave the paper to, to Bart a week before Yoder was to be examined for his PhD by Bart and other faculty at Bonn. <laughs> Bart began the exam observing, Herr Yoder, you Mennonites are so bellicose. Bart obviously not only uh, respected Yoder's courage, but he enjoyed the challenge. I've tried to show that Bart's humor is not a personality quirk. Rather, the way he taught himself to do theology is itself a testimony to the humor necessary if theology is to be a free discipline. I suggested above that when Christians think they must do theology in a manner that ensures that the way things are is the way things must be, the result cannot help but be the loss of humor. Bart was a free theologian because he thought theology that is a witness to God cannot help but manifest the sheer joy made possible for the recognition we are not alone. Which finally brings me back to me. A number of times when I've been introduced before, go, before giving a lecture, this story is told of my encounter with a student at Harvard. It seems I was walking across Harvard looking for the library. Not sure where I was going, not sure I was going in the right direction. I asked an undergraduate if they could tell me where the library was at. The undergraduate responded by observing, at Harvard we do not end sentences with a preposition. <laughs> I'm said to have responded, can you tell me where the library is at, asshole? <laughs> <laughs> there is one problem with that story. The problem is it didn't happen. <laughs> the story, however, now seems to have reached a, a canonical stage so that it makes no difference whether it happened or not because the story confirms how many both negative and positive have judgments about me. I relate this phenomenon because the story also reflects the general presumption that I'm a funny guy. Some even think I have a gift for the one-liner. It is not for me to claim to be funny, but I do hope I've been able to do theology in a funny manner. I think my work is funny at least in two ways. First, I hope my work uh, first, I hope my work is really funny in the sense that people laugh out loud about something I've said or written. I know I laugh at what I often say, and I see no reason that others should not laugh with me about me. <laughs> Secondly, my work is funny because I try to find ways to do theology in disguise. So I push the limits of, pre of presuppositions about what theology is to be if it is serious, in the hope that the difference might make a difference for how we live. I think I'm at my best as a humorist 
in prayers. So I think it appropriate to bring an end to this paper with this prayer. Funny Lord, how we love this life you have given us. Of course, we have tried, we have tried bored, worn down by the stupidity that surrounds us. But then that stupid person does something, says something that is wonderful, funny, and insightful. How we hate for that to happen. <laughs> but thank God you have given us one another, ensuring we will never be able to get out, to get our lives in order. Order is finally no fun, and you're not intent on forcing us to see humor, of, and you are intent on forcing us to see the humor of your kingdom. I mean, really, Lord, the Jews. But there you have it. You insist on being known through such a funny people. And now us, part of your joke on the world. Make us your laughter. Make us laugh. And in the laughter, may the world be so enthralled by your entertaining presence that we lose the fear that fuels our violence. Funny Lord. How we love this life you've given us. Amen. Thank you very much. Uh, I can testify that many people who study theology do spend a good bit of time laughing at how one liners. We've been doing so in the office all week. Anticipating him coming, you should Google this. Power lost one line. <laughs> Dr. Howard has agreed to do a few minutes of question and answer time with us. And so you have this opportunity to ask uh, one of America's premier theologians a question about anything related to the topic, uh, tonight's lecture, or on some other pressing topic. So, who would like to go first? Is it possible to laugh about that if there is no resurrection? Uh, let me repeat that question for people to hear it. Is it possible to laugh about death if there's no resurrection? Well, descriptively, um, people have. Um, the question is, is what kind of laughter that is. And I think it's too often the laughter of despair. And um, um, laughter in the face of death um, is, I think, um, the strong affirmation we will not find ourselves alone. And that that um, um, means uh, there's a there's a um, there's a funny joke. I, I don't know if I mean context obviously makes all the difference as I was arguing, but um, there was a Methodist pastor who had spent year after year being a faithful Methodist minister, moved every two or three years by his district superintendent to a worse church and he died and he went to heaven and um, uh, he said Pastor Jones is here and Peter looked and said I can't find you in the book you go to the other place and so uh, he um, uh, he went to the other place and um, Peter was doing some bookkeeping and he found Pastor Jones name so he sent Michael down and he said, get Jones, um, uh, we made a mistake, he, he doesn't belong in hell. And John, he found Jones in hell up to his neck in um, uh, a fire and brimstone. And uh, Michael said, uh, Pastor Jones, um, uh, there's been a terrible mistake. Um, uh, you're actually on the rolls, you're, you belong in heaven. Uh, just follow me. And Jones said, no. And he said, Pastor Jones, you understand? There really was a mistake. You belong in heaven. Jones said, no. And Michael said, I don't understand. Uh, there you are. You're up to the neck in brimstone. 
uh, and you can go to heaven. What's wrong? Why can't you? He said, I'm standing on the shoulders of my district superintendent. The, um, uh, uh, the, um, the, um, uh, how we imagine what it would mean to be um, with other people, I think, is uh, crucial. And that's the reason why the image of the communion of the saints is so important. Because I think what we fear about death, interestingly enough, is not just annihilation, but loneliness. And part of what the resurrection is about is the affirmation that we will be with God. We don't know. We, we don't know how to imagine that, but that is, and that creates the possibility of, um, of, of a, a whole genre of humor. There's the story of um, 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 Bart and Bultman both died relatively close to one another. And they went to heaven and they, were, and they discovered everything in heaven was extraordinarily egalitarian. So no one got any special privileges. And uh, they were standing in line for lunch. And a little man, balding in a white coat, uh, pushed in front of them and was going down the line. And Bart turned to one of the, his near neighbors and said, well, who in the hell is that? And they said, oh, that's God. He likes to pretend he's a doctor. <laughs> uh, so, I mean, you know, you, you can get things going uh, uh, like that. But I do, I do think that there is a profound relationship between resurrection and humor about death. Yes? First of all, thank you so much for coming, Dr. Harwas. Um, who would you say uh, are the top two or three people or theologians who have shaped your view of nonviolence? Well, of course, John Howard Yoder um, is uh, one. Um, um, I would have to say also um, Dorothy Day. Um, who was, of course, the Catholic worker movement, um, has had a profound impact. And um, Bart and Bonhoeffer, even though Bart wasn't seen as a pacifist, I think his arguments to move in those directions. So that's, those are the fundamental people. Everyone must read the politics of Jesus before you leave uh, school. Other questions? Comments? Yes? Uh, if you've never read anything of mine before,